My name is Rachel Woody. We're here on May 30th, 2013 with Bill Nelson at the Oregon Wine Board. And my first question for you, Bill, is what inspired you to be involved in the wine industry? Well, now there's an interesting story because uh, I had not too long ago in 1970, I got a PhD in biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania. But what I wanted to do which was to do some innovative teaching, particularly for undergraduates in, uh, in science, who were not in science, non-science majors, but who really needed to know a little bit about science, um, was something that at that time, which was one of the periodic tight periods, wasn't going to get done. So, lo and behold, uh, my wife and I moved to Oregon, and we moved to Eugene, in the summer of 71 and uh, then I was casting about to do something. Now I had a big background in biochemistry and biological things and at one point in the spring of 72 I was uh, talking to people. I actually was visiting at the Mondavi winery mm. in California and I said, well you guys ever hire biochemists or something? And they said, well you know there's this winery in Oregon uh, and we just tried some of their Gewürztraminer. It was really good and it's the name of the winery is Hillcrest Vineyard. So I said, well that's swell. That's not far from Eugene mm -hmm. and what the heck. I'll give them a call. So so I called and I spoke to Richard Summer, who was pretty much the entire thing of uh, Hillcrest, and I said, well, um, do you have a chemist or somebody who does that stuff for you? And I said, well, <laughs> no, not, not uh -huh. really. Um, and I said, well, maybe uh, we could work something out. So mm -hmm. I spent a couple of months just visiting and learning about wine. Uh, which I was interested in anyway, um, but as not as a professional at the time. And uh, we eventually got to the point where I started uh, getting paid and I started uh, doing testing. And that collaboration went from 1972, basically the spring summer of 72, until about 86 when I phased out okay. because it was time to move on and I became more involved with the activities of the Oregon Wine Growers Association. But the beginning of that involvement was 1977. In any event, um, I did work with Richard and I also worked with uh, several other wineries, many of them in Southern Oregon, including uh, Giardet and Davidson, which didn't last very long, and uh, Siskiyou Vineyards, and there may be some others, I'm not sure. I ended up having quite a few little consulting gigs, and I helped people get into the business and whatnot. And we established some interesting things at Hillcrest and definitely went on an improvement binge. Um, and so uh, we can follow up on that more in a later question. I find it interesting that almost all roads to Oregon wine are through Richard Summer. Well, he's the grandfather, or I guess you would say at this point, or the father of the modern industry. Mm -hmm. He came, he got interested in wine in about 1960 and started casting about looking for a place and he had an Oregon background. He had family in the uh, Medford area and was familiar with that and he settled on in 1961 he planted grapes in the site that he found. He, found, he liked that site because of the exposure and the soils and um, it's an interesting crapshoot at the time because nobody knew anything. That was back when people would say you can't possibly grow grapes in Oregon and he knew better because he was familiar with growing fruit in southern Oregon and knew it could be done. So he planted grapes in 1961 and made his first wine in 1963. And other people 
you know, Dick Erath and others went by to see Richard and pick his brain and think about uh, what to do. Richard uh, did a uh, planting of about 10 or 12 varieties, small amounts of them, in what he called his home vineyard, which was about, uh, I don't know, six to seven acres uh, right uh, by the winery. And then he picked the ones that he liked to expand. And he thought the best flavor profiles he was getting were from Cabernet Sauvignon and White Riesling. So those became the primary plantings that he had uh, when I got there in 71. And he had another vineyard, which I think was 13 or 14 acres across the street uh, on land that I don't think he owned, but I think he leased. Um, so when, when I got there, it was primarily a Riesling operation with a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. What was it like working with him? Well, Richard is the oddest of the odd, uh, and everybody would credit him with that. Uh, he and I eventually got really quite close and could read each other's minds to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time going over how to approach things and strategies and whatnot. Uh, Richard was also a very frustrating person to work with because he had, the, he would, I think, say, is an overdeveloped sense of thrift coming from his Swiss ancestors. Um, and that, that hurt him at times. At times, he did things that uh, save a little bit of money, which were truly penny wise and very pound foolish. Mm. And so there was a lot of uh, tension trying, okay, this is not the way to go. This isn't worth doing. You're not helping where the ultimate product goes. And mm. that went on for all the years I was there in one form or another. One time I remember he took a trip to, Canada and he came back and said, oh, I got this wonderful continuous press and I go, oh my God. <laughs> uh, and uh, eventually, within about a year, I was able to convince him that this was not a piece of equipment that he wanted or should use because it hurt the quality of what he was trying to make. And that, that was just a struggle and there were many of those struggles. Richard is, was famous for washing filter pads and hanging them up on a clothesline to dry so he could reuse them again. And that was probably not the wisest thing to do. Have you had an opportunity to work or meet with Dyson, who eventually took over Hillcrest? Yes, I... I in the last year, I think a year before Richard died, uh, he and I, I went to visit Richard and we went out and visited with Dyson and talked about things. Dyson made a lot of changes. He really essentially threw out what he found and started over in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, um, Hillcrest in Richard's time was primarily a Riesling vineyard. And it, under Dyson, it's, uh, the Riesling is just a minor, minor um, piece of it, and it's more, I think Dyson is into certain red varieties mm -hmm. um, that weren't there before, and very small amounts. At one point, Hillcrest was producing about 25,000 gallons per year, and now I think it's down to about 1,200 or something like that. You could find out from Dyson. So you touched on it briefly, but what has been your involvement in the Oregon wine industry and then of course nationally? Well, personally, uh, I started consulting for a number of other wineries. Uh, I was involved with Girardet Vineyard from the start and very heavily involved. I came into working with Siskiyou a couple of years after they had started and uh, worked on some changes there and improvements. And then I worked at some other wineries in the Eugene area and other places 
in Oregon. So I had a consulting business up until 1990. I did other things because the Oregon wine street was really tiny. And so it was hard to get what amounted to be a full-time job. So I was doing other things until uh, I think I became full-time in wine about 1985. And I started working with the Oregon Wine Growers Association in 1977 and I did that because um, people were complaining that uh, the state's going to raise the tax on wine and that's going to put us all out of business and there was two organizations at that time, the Wine Growers Council of Oregon and the Oregon Wine Growers Association and I said well probably you need to send somebody to Salem to explain things and see if you can get them to pay attention to you and I made a proposal to both groups that was so inexpensive they couldn't resist right. and uh, so what happened while well, the tax in fact did go up from 45 cents a gallon to 65 cents from 40 cents a gallon to 65 cents a gallon for the Oregon wineries, it went to zero effectively oh. be, because of um, lobbying. And at that time, the Oregon Wine Advisory Board was founded to do research. That it was later expanded to do marketing. So I was the only lobbyist and official presence of the Oregon Wine Growers Association. The two groups merged in 79 or 80, I think, 80 probably. And I was the only representative uh, for them, uh, the only one who had uh, a job type function until um, 1994. And I became full time with the Oregon Wine Growers Association and moved to Portland in 1990. I don't know how much chronology you want, it kind of takes away yeah, from this the story. Is great stuff, <laughs> chronology and story, yeah. a happy blend, hopefully. All right, so while we're talking about the Oregon Wine Growers Association, uh, you spoke about your involvement. Could you speak to how you've seen it evolve? Well, I, I used to write some articles. I wonder if they're still around. Um, they must be archived somewhere in Lane County, but I wrote I had a column for the Willamette Valley Observer in the early 80s I think and I think in 1980 I wrote a piece that said well you know in 1970 there were I think the answer was six wineries and as we go into 1980 mm -hmm. there are 30 something mm -hmm. and I bet that number will double by 1990 and it did and now there's some 400 or 500. I don't know what the latest count is. I think so, it's around at least 400 now. Yeah. So um, there has been a huge expansion, and that is also in quantity. Right now, it's fairly easy to get a winery license, and some people get winery licenses that aren't truly wineries, which wasn't the case back then. Um, so you also have to look at total production, and total production has gone way up. I think when uh, Drew Ann started and gave a talk, I, I think that was in the mid 80s or something like that, um, 87 maybe, I said, you know, to somebody half jokingly, well, there'll probably be a million cases of Oregon Pinot Noir made here pretty soon. And they looked at me like I was insane, but in mm -hmm. fact, I think it's a million, million and a half now or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there, it has been a tremendous growth from a tiny, tiny little base. Mm. I mean, back when I started, there were maybe uh, 10,000 cases made in the early in the 70s, in all of Oregon wow. in the early 70s. There were some fruit, and if you take out the fruit wineries, I'm not even sure you can get to 10,000 cases. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were fruit wineries in existence before Richard got here. Pioneer Homestead was here, uh, and, and there may be someone else as well. But mm -hmm. Richard was the first uh, of the modern era of um, producing vinifera in Oregon. Now, in the turn of the century, there were wineries in Oregon, David Hill Winery, mm -hmm. which is now 
it's, I don't know what it's called now. Um, I think it still is David Hill. Oh, David Hill, Hill right. Yeah. yeah. This has gone back to the old name. Yes. But it was Charles Curry for a while mm -hmm. and then Rudy's Ru 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 Hill. Hill. Yeah. Yes. And there were others as well, uh, but they became defunct with Prohibition. Mm -hmm. So uh, things have come back. So uh, I started seeing that this was going somewhere, and I was very enthusiastic about it, Oregon Wines. And I made that case to the legislature, which is why the legislature, by and large, was very favorable and did things like changing the license entirely, mm -hmm. which we did in 1979, and did the um, did an expansion of the tax exemption in 1981, along with uh, the $25 a ton assessment and the two cents a gallon that goes to the Oregon Wine Board. So uh, I, I was enthusiastic and I was able to explain that enthusiasm to people in the legislature and said that one day this will be something that Oregon is truly known for and right. that has been true for at least 10 or 15 years now. Right. Were you a part of the Oregon Wine Growers Association as it became Oregon Wine Board? Okay, well, you have a fundamental confusion, which unfortunately is uh, shared by others. All right, the Oregon Wine like Growers Association and the Oregon Wine Board are totally different. Mm -hmm. um, and the Oregon Wine Growers Association is a trade association which dates back to the 60s um, and has the ability to lobby. The Oregon Wine Board is a state entity, a state agency, right. okay. uh, and it was convert a conversion of the Oregon Wine Advisory Board. The Oregon Wine Advisory Board was created in 1977, as I said, as part of the deal, like, uh, of the tax deal, uh, and it was first job was just to do research. In 1981, it was expanded to do research and marketing and got more funding. Uh, and then in the 90s, uh, to get around some problems with being part of the Department of Agriculture, um, it became a uh, quasi-autonomous state agency or whatever people call it now, um, like the Port of Portland and some of the other mm -hmm. uh, things like that. It gave it a little more flexibility, ability to get out of some of the rules that governed the Department of Agriculture, which were very con restricting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Unfortunately, many people conflate the two organizations. Right. Well, and acronyms and all of that. Oregon Wine and then insert acronyms. It's, I'm still learning them all. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're from Washington. It should be no problem. Oh, Tigard, actually. So just a little. Well, I know, but I oh, you DC. spent time in D.C. Oh, yes, that so, Washington. So, so you had your training. It's true, yeah. Oh, federal acronyms. <laughs> um, so moving on from the Oregon Wine Growers Association, uh, would you speak to, I believe you're involved in a more national... In 1994, I left the Oregon Wine Growers Association, moved to Washington, D.C., and uh, was the first vice president, eventually president of the National Association of American Wineries, mm -hmm. which had some name changes uh, along the way. It was American Association of Vintners for a while, but its current name and the name it's most known by is Wine America. Wine America. And I was there until two years ago, which would be 2011 or something like that. Um, and. So uh, I started doing things at the national level, working on the farm bill and stuff like that, and r research. Uh, getting grape research done in this country has always been something I've really been involved in. Um, because uh, wine and grapes are somewhat unique in that there's probably a hundred different price points instead of it's not a commoditized business mm -hmm. it's really uh, research dependent to move up that ladder and stay on that up on the higher part of the la ladder which is profitable but to get there you need to be research intensive and for some reason the United States really lagged in its commitment to wine research so while I was in Washington, we greatly added to the amount of wine research that was done. 
in the country probably went from about federal research of a million or a million and a half dollars a year to 25 to 30. Which still is, is not enough, but it's, it's a big movement. I guess I'm used to starting from nothing and getting to something. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense as to why you then became part of the more national movement. Right. And, you know, it's getting people to appreciate that that's research investment is worth doing. I mean, it's more than 30% of the wine consumed in this country is imported, and that doesn't have mm. to be. There's no reason for that. Uh, there's no inherent reason for it. Um, well, we need to get our quality in, up and our price to quality ratios in good places, and that requires research and it requires commitment. And because it's so fragmented, there are very few very big players, um, it, you need uh, to really support that with federal funds or government funds for research rather than uh, try to get it by passing the hat. When you've got four or five big players that control most of the market in an in a industry, you know, like Intel, um, then they support most of their own research, but it's proprietary and it doesn't help out the other folks. Right. Were you involved with, obviously you were involved to a great deal with the research and really trying to communicate the Oregon wine message. Were you involved also in the marketing or sort of helping to construct the Oregon wine identity? I pretty much was not involved with that except peripherally, but that was, other people did that. And that was the separation between the Oregon Wine Board and the Oregon Wine Growers Association. Mm -hmm. So uh, I served on the uh, Oregon Wine Advisory Board for, I don't know, four or six years. And during that time, we provided seed money for the uh, uh, Oregon Pinot Noir, uh, the IPNC, International mm -hmm. Pinot, Pinot Noir, Noir Celebration. Celebration. So uh, that might not have gotten started without a little bit of seed money, and uh, I was definitely supportive of that. But my role in marketing was relatively limited. Now, I had a role with various wineries in helping them market, and I made trips, and I inspired other people to be more involved in marketing. but. Marketing was not my fundamental role. Moving to, to Southern Oregon, can you speak to the general spirit down there or the camaraderie? Well, Southern Oregon is fragmented and does not have as coherent a climate as you have in the Willamette Valley. The Willamette Valley, pretty much all of it uh, is, is reasonably suited with some variations of Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and now Chardonnay, and, and some other varieties as well. In Southern Oregon, they always used to say about the Roseburg area that it's the land of 10,000 valleys. Um, and Douglas County, I guess, more, more than just Roseburg. And in fact, the weather, the climate and the terroir changed enormously if you go a few miles down the road. So getting a coherent identity for what's being done in Southern Oregon is, was and still is, I think, a, a problem. I mean, you've got people doing Alberino and Tempranillo. Mm -hmm. You've got people doing Merlot. Cabernet, Zinfandel, and I don't think anyone clearly knows what to do and where to do it, and it doesn't have a marketing identity. So while um, Troon Vineyard makes this fabulous Zinfandel, um, virtually nobody else is making Zinfandel, right. so you can't market Southern Oregon as this is how Zinfandel should be. Although one could make a pretty good case is that, in fact, the Troon Vineyard Zinfandel is right up there among, amongst the best. And that, that hurts your ability to market. 
whereas you get all of this press for Oregon PNOR because PNOR is so clearly identified with the Willamette Valley and other regions don't do very well with it. Mm. So um, that's a, been a problem with with Southern Oregon, and it's hard to overcome that. The land is less expensive there, so you have people making investments there. And I think maybe some coherence will come, or maybe it will be five or six different coherences. Because, I mean, the Illinois Valley is totally different than the Missouri Valley. Uh, or, and they're totally different than the Roseburg area. And the Roseburg area, you know, what Scott Henry is doing is totally different than what Hillcrest did. And mm. Melrose is, a, is another one. You know, it's just so variable that it's going to take, you know, it took for other parts of the world, you know, in some cases it took five, six, seven hundred years to sort out what should be done where. And um, we are moving faster because we have more knowledge and we can spread knowledge more quickly, but it still is going to take time. And that process hasn't, I think, fully evolved in Southern Oregon. Um, but it's, it's pretty coherent in the Willamette Valley with Pinot Noir. You go to Hood River and you're in another, pro you're in the same problem again. But Walla Walla and the Willamette Valley seem to have pretty much coalesced as to what people think they should do. I mean, there's still work being done trying to get the identity for Chardonnay and the Willamette Valley sorted out, but that came about because of clonal problems and other things that set it back hmm. quite a bit, getting the right thing. The clones that were developed for California were just inappropriate for the Willamette Valley right. until they got sorted out. Um, and it took about 20 or 30 years to do that. Um, we weren't able to move forward with the Chardonnay, but that's starting to happen now. Some really good Chardonnays are being made. But there isn't very much Chardonnay grown in Oregon compared to, say, Pinot Noir. Right. Um, and then people in the Willamette Valley, because of price reasons, I think, not so much because of quality, have pretty much dropped out of the Riesling yeah, well, the Willamette Valley Riesling can be really good. Not too many people do it because it's hard to sell. Hmm. Just not as a popular varietal? It, um, you could argue that Oregon Riesling is amongst the world's best Riesling. It's a better food wine than German Riesling. It's um, it got a tremendous amount of character in it and is a lovely wine, but the public is not willing to spend real money for it. So it's very hard to get over $10 a bottle for Riesling, and of course you've got Saint Michel with a guadzillion cases uh, under $10, I still think they still are. So, uh, you know, why, why bother <laughs> when you can uh, get 40 or $50 for a bottle of PNOR? And Riesling is a hard wine to make. Uh, in some ways, it, it's one of the harder wines to make because of residual sugar issues and and other, and because it's very late to harvest. So mm -hmm. people pretty much have thrown up their hands and, and don't do that in any large commercial way, at least in the Willamette Valley. I think that's a fair statement. Okay. What would you say sets Southern Oregon apart from the rest of the other wine growing regions? Well, it's a little warmer than um, in the Willamette Valley. The season can be a little shorter because there are some um, frost problems, uh, but it's more suited to warmer weather varietals, um, varieties. Uh, and as I said, the big problem is that there is no obvious answer to what grape should I be growing in Southern Oregon. Um, and because you don't have the identity, it's very difficult to get the marketing going. Um, so if you ask somebody on the street, what do you think, 
what you think of Willamette Valley wines, they'll say very quickly, I love Borg and Pinot Noir. Mm. You say, what do you think of Rogue Valley wines? They'll say, well, I sort of like Troon Zinfandel, or I sort of like uh, um, Quaddy North's Rosé, or I like somebody's Cabernet, but they don't have a clear identity that you can say. If you ask somebody, what do they think of Walla Walla wines, then they would say, well, they make some great Merlot and Cabernet there, and at a very high level. So that holds things back, and it makes it hard to sell wines at, at a higher price point. So you don't see a lot of $40 wines coming out of Southern Oregon, whereas you do see a lot from either Walla Walla or Willamette Valley. Will that sort out in time? I'm not sure. You know, it's just, um, it's just difficult to see what will happen. You know, it, it's hard to see 20, 30 years ahead, and then it's particularly cloudy for Southern Oregon because the coalescing is not happening as far as I can tell. Hmm. Maybe somebody else will disagree with that. I'd be, love to hear what other people have to say on that issue. Right. I think that's definitely a question I'll pose to the rest of the Southern mm -hmm. wine industry members, I ask. You know, and the Southern folks have had an inferiority complex because they feel like, uh, why should Oregon be marketing Pinot Noir and why should Oregon be doing its identity with Pinot Noir? Well, because that works, you know, it's a clear identity. The fire, the public understands it. You can go to Washington, D.C., and there'll be a hundred restaurants. They'll have a couple of Oregon wines, and they'll all be Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of Pinot Gris. Um, and uh, you just can't, you know, that's the problem the Oregon Wine Board had, or in its predecessor, always faced. You know, how do we market Oregon and still be fair to the, what the people are doing in Southern Oregon. And it's even exacerbated down because there's been a lot of investment in Southern Oregon. Their production is way up, but production of what? <laughs> mm. You know, and how do you get press for it? And how do you get uh, on wine lists? And how do you market it? Because if you have to sell it all at Fred Meyer, you're, you're lucky to get $20 a bottle if that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it is really difficult. And if you know you're going to take Troon Zinfandel and try to sell it in California, you probably will be successful at that. But it's a much steeper climb than saying, "Okay, let's take some uh, Oregon Pinot Noir and sell it in San Francisco," which is, you know, wasn't easy before, but is easier now. Right. So moving to the, the larger Oregon wine industry, I have notes from when you made predictions in the past decades and they ended up coming true. Do you have predictions for where the industry will go in the next few decades? Well, it's still a tiny industry and it's tiny in terms of its potential. So uh, my sense is that you will get three or four or five very solid uh, producers of medium price Pinot Noir, A to Z price, mm -hmm. $20, or Firesteed, uh, or Dobbs, or one of his labels. Um, but you also will see a great expansion of higher 30 to $50 PNR being sold. I hope that the Southern Oregon folks can break through. I mean, as I said, uh, I think there's some great wines being made down there, but um, how you get a, a market for them. One of the big accomplishments in my career has been getting uh, so you can have direct shipment of wine, which is something we really started in Oregon, although no one gives us credit for it, but we did that in, in the mid 80s. Um, and California was able to pass a law before we could pass a law. But um, mm -hmm. if, as that becomes a, a greater opportunity, then for some of the wineries like in Southern Oregon, if you get 
a list of loyal customers. If you get 10,000 loyal customers, and you can probably get 500 a year, so getting a 10,000 is only a 20 year kind of right. thing. I mean, you have to do some replacements, but if you get 10,000 loyal customers buying a case of Troon Zinfandel, um, you suddenly have a viable market going on. And that uh, builds, and that also builds interest in restaurants. Customers, you know, in wine marketing, customers become like hubs. You get one here, one there, and they're mm -hmm. scattered, and they start talking to their friends and whatnot, and eventually it, it catches on. So I see uh, Oregon wine probably doubling every 10 years in quantity. You know, um, certainly there's more money coming in now. It was capital start for a long time. But when Jackson family gets involved, you're talking about serious capital, and then you got some smaller players but are willing to, to make large investments. So um, it'll probably double. I think it is like 40, a little bit more than 40,000 tons of grapes produced per year right now in Oregon. So my guess is that when you get to 2020, it'll be about 100,000 tons, maybe more. Uh, it's still small compared to the rest of the world in California. I mean, I think California is, I've forgotten the numbers, but we could look it up offline. Um, I think California is about, uh, I could probably figure this out off the top of my head. Let's see. I think there's about two, two plus million tons produced mm. in California per year. There's National Agricultural Statistical Service can can dig that up for you. But so you still at a hundred thousand tons at a, you know which would be more than a doubling of, of where you're currently it's still, you don't get to be 10% of California. In terms of wine production, Oregon is about 1% of the country's wine. Washington wow. State's about 4%. So there is tremendous upside. It will take greater mechanisms. Now, one of the things that I think will be very interesting to see how it develops and um, see what Tom says about this is I think export markets will develop and that uh, their Southern Oregon may do better because you can be, you have more of a brand identity in an export market. So if you, for example, were able to get a Chinese distributor that liked your wine a lot and you were able to sell 20,000 cases uh, to them for use in their restaurants, um, that would be a major, I mean, 20,000 case winery is still a relatively big winery in Oregon. There's probably only less, fewer than 10 that are more than 20,000 cases. So that would put you on the map, and you wouldn't necessarily have to have the Pinot Noir identification. It could be whatever it is. Um, it could, you know, so um, I think there will also be a narrowing of the production. You start out in this business, you tend to make 10 different wines to see what works and to have some diversification. I think as you get more sophisticated, you also get to produce only a couple of wines in serious quantities. So many of the Willamette Valley wineries are producing one or maybe two types of wines, Pinot Noir, and some gradations of it, but Pinot Noir and maybe Pinot Gris, and some don't even have Pinot Gris. Right. So I think you'll see that in Southern Oregon as they, you know, as um, Abacella at some point may decide that it's just going to be Tempranillo and Alberino or whatever. Mm -hmm. But right now they've got 10 or 12 different varieties that they're playing with. 
So you get your specialization and then you get your marketing specialization going where you have a few channels that, that do real business for you and becomes more efficient. And you can sell at, at better price points. So New Zealand, for example, which is about the same age as Oregon in terms of development, it's pretty much just Sauvignon Blanc, and now developing some Pinot Noir. But you know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc has a reputation, and they can sell that uh, pretty effectively. In Australia, it's Shiraz. Unfortunately, hasn't been doing well lately. But mm -hmm. um, you you get this narrowing as the channel gets dug deeper, if you will, to do a metaphor. Right. Now, at some point, you might even go to, I think this will happen, but probably not in my lifetime, where you get more of a European style marketing, like, uh, you know, Burgundy is what's selling you. Not necessarily, some people know it's Pinot Noir, others don't. Uh, Bordeaux wines, our blends and very few people know what particular blend is in a particular bottle. It's the area. Mm -hmm. And I think that is becoming true to some degree. Um, it's not, when people go to a restaurant, they don't necessarily want a Pinot Noir. They may want a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Because if you get a California Pinot Noir, or a Castle Ridge or something like that, it's a totally different wine. Right. And so that, I think you'll start to go to more terroir-driven marketing. And maybe at that point, the sub-regions in Southern Oregon will start to make sense. I, I don't know how you ever get there in Roseburg because it changes so much so fast. I mean, at Hillcrest, uh, Richard eventually bought a vineyard, I wish he hadn't, uh, that was about three miles away. And the quality of the Riesling, it was totally different. Mm. And it was like night and day, and, and you know, it wasn't helpful. <laughs> uh, because it took away from the identity that you have. And so I think that's generally true in the Umqua, and maybe less so in, in the Applegate. I mean, the Applegate, I think, is a little more coherent, but I don't really mm -hmm. know. Um, and we'll see what drives that. Now, Troon is talking about having 300 acres and vines or something like that, which is a huge mm -hmm. uh, planning for that region. And he may drive the whole thing to Zinfandel. And that may not be a bad idea. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what Chris says. Have you met Chris or you know about him? Not yet. I met uh, the tasting room manager, Chelsea, in Carlton, mm. their Carlton branch. Yeah. But I do hope to go visit Troon. Yeah, go go see Chris, Chris Martin, and um, he's got financial resources, but I think he also has a sense of what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very impressed. Actually, For when I was working with Siski, we were one of the first buyers of Tr the grapes from the original Troon Vineyard. It was very small. Now they're up to three, four hundred acres, but the original, which was Dick Troon's Vineyard, um, and I had to convince them to buy the Zinfandel because I said, you can't buy the Cabernet and the Chardonnay and leave them with an acre of Zinfandel. And then they showed them how to make it. They won a big prize. And that's how Southern Oregon Zinfandel got on the map. Wow. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a really good fit down there. But we'll see. It just takes time. Mm -hmm. and patience and for that you need deep pockets or you need to be able to work like Richard did with you know spending no money Richard is the master of thrift he is imprinted on my character not necessarily in a positive way this sense of never paying more for something than you have to and being excessively thrifty often to the disadvantage of what I'm trying to accomplish, but it's just so strong. Um, he just had that uh, as a character that was so strong, and it rubs off after a while. <laughs> 
Well, do you have any suggestions for me for who we should talk to, where we should look into, especially when it comes to Southern Oregon history? Well, there are a lot of characters <laughs> in Southern Oregon, but I mean, you really want to go and talk to Scott Henry pretty quickly because he's a thoughtful guy who, he must be getting up there in the years at this point. Um, and of course his, I mean, he developed a trellising system that's now used throughout the world under his name, so that's pretty exciting. Um, Earl Jones is, is a good guy to talk to. Chris Martin. Mark Wisnowski has been around forever. Uh, he isn't always mainstream, but um, he's an interesting guy. Ted Gerber, who's been there for a long time at Forest, he's a, a very thoughtful character. He tends not to mingle that much with the rest of the world, but he's a good guy to talk to. And uh, Bob Caravan, who's getting pretty old, but I think he's still coherent at um, Bridgeview, is quite a character, and he will rail on about his own views, which are, are not widespread, but he's been pretty successful there. I think the big question mark in Southern Oregon is how do you develop an identity? I think I've hit that mm -hmm. a few times, and I think that's a question that you should put to people, you know, what is going to be the identity of Southern Oregon wine? Now, one of the answers may be it's all going to be brand, you know, each of us will have our own particulars. But I think brand's a hard sell in wine. Wine tends to be much more regional, mm -hmm. historically, and there are very few, you know, people are buying a wine from the Rhone in France, they're almost, you know, the third question is, who's the producer? Um, but you decide on that. And when you go to a restaurant asking about wine, they're almost always talking about where the wine is from, and then maybe the variety, and then the producer. So um, you're going to have to answer what does where mean for Southern Oregon, for Southern Oregon to get traction. And maybe it'll be four things. Maybe it'll be Illinois Valley, Applegate, the rest of the Rogue, and something for Roseburg. Maybe it'll be five Roseburg regions, but they don't have the plannings to justify that now. Yeah, I believe Elkton is the new, newest AVA. Yeah, you get it, but I mean, who, who knows from Elkton? I mean, who knows from, barely knows Willamette Valley. You go out there and you try to market your wine as Ribbon Ridge, uh, which is a very good appellation, but there's only 10 people who know it outside of the, outside of the locals. So, I mean, right now it's almost like one of the things I kept talking to people about in the, 80s was you've got to have Oregon on the label because even though you might be an Appalachian, that's something that people can relate to. Now I think Willamette Valley is, is understood, but I don't think some of these sub Appalachians are. Yet there's a huge difference between Dundee Hills and um, and the Eola Hills. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're close enough to it, you know that is a significant distinction, but in terms of the people who are buying the wine, who are in the East Coast, you know, well, what the hell is that? Right. We're lucky if they know where Oregon is on the map. That's right. <laughs> Oregon. Yes. <laughs> well, that was all of my purposeful questions to you. Okay. Are there areas that I missed that I should have known to ask you about? Well, one area that's close to my heart is that you have to build a, a regulatory environment that's favorable. And that's probably what I was most involved in doing, building the, the laws and the regulations that are favorable. And uh, people, you know, don't like to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but it's what gets you to where you can move forward. So that was a big thing. And Oregon, since the 70s, has really been since the 80s at least, has been a, a real leader 
in how to solve those problems. Another whole issue that's tremendously important is land use. And while there are some battles that go on, uh, the big issue was would you get housing in all of these hillsides? Right. I mean, one big issue that was Richard Summer fought real hard for was somebody wanted to do a development in the hills somewhere, not too far from where Hillcrest was, and um, they went to the county commissioners and said, well, this land isn't good for farming. It doesn't have the soils that, because originally good farmland was defined by soils, but of course the best soils for growing grapes are like the worst soils. <laughs> so um, there ended up being a court case where the developer wanted to say this isn't really farmland and you should be able to rezone it. And um, Richard was saying, no, this is, could be grape land and therefore it should not be rezoned. And there were versions of that in Yamhill County and everywhere else mm -hmm. because all of these uh, hillsides could have been five acre uh, housing developments. So right. uh, that's one of the big issues that's still there, but it is a major uh, structural thing. Do you preserve the land? for farm use because if if you've got to work your way around five acre plots it's just not practical yeah are you keeping up with a lot of other regulation movements or ways the industry has been going like being lead certified and the low input viticulture a little bit, but now that I'm retired, put out the pasture, I haven't been, I've tried to, I've worked with OSU on figuring out how to do research in the Oregon Wine Research Institute. That's been my biggest involvement. And I help out a little bit here and there. So I helped uh, the Oregon Wine Growers Association have a retreat to work on strategic planning and help them a little bit but um, you know new people need to come up with new ideas I miss it but it, holding on to it is a little awkward <laughs> <laughs> well you are so intensely involved even to a national scale mm. I can imagine it's to retire and only be in the first couple of years you're still finding that balance exactly but uh, it was fun. I mean, it was fun to be part of something that didn't exist and became something that's world famous. Just like it's a very unusual thing that I think attracts people to the wine business is that you can start with what I used to say it was soil, water, plant materials, and sunlight, and from that you can have right down to a world-famous consumer product. Mm -hmm. And you have all of those parts, and it's within the realm of a family business. That's unusual. Uh, and it's part of what makes it attractive and part of why it's such a good fit for Oregon, because Oregon is not particularly corporate. It is more what we might call entrepreneurial, but there's some special word needs to be for this, and it's, it's a real ownership thing, the ownership of the product and the brand name. And I think that attracts people. And even the Jackson family um, wire, I mean, they, just Jackson, who was involved with uh, why America, you know, he always had that sense of, you know, this is something that I want to be involved in from everything. And he started from nowhere and developed a very big operation. But, um, and the Gallows had to retain some of that as well. It's an unusual business where personal involvement and personal supervision and, and emotional involvement is an important part of it. So it's been fun to be part of that and not stuck in some kind of corporate research lab. Right. So you spent about 20 years in D.C.? 16. 16. And when you retired, 
I read one of the press releases about your retirement, mm. and um, there's still a question mark about where you would retire to with your wife. Mm. And you came to Portland. Yeah, so I always had an affection for Portland. And Portland's gotten to be an exciting place, and part of the excitement in Portland, I think, is this whole food thing, which was originally driven by the wine thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when I started in the 70s, you go to a typical Oregon restaurant and you look at wines and say, well, we have white, red, and rosé. You know, and now, now everybody's got Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that, I think, drives the whole food culture in Portland, which gets national press it every day I and mean, I just saw something about I guess it was in the New York Times or maybe the Wall Street Journal today that you know is mentioning um, um, restaurants that are attracting 20 year olds and what do they have they had some restaurant in New York with Wall Street Journal plus um, the Lincoln <laughs> restaurant in in Portland mm -hmm. so it's like uh, that's become part of, of the culture of Oregon and you know the farmers market is all coming together into more of you know less corporate and more personal involvement when you go to the farmers market you get a, a feel for that same thing because there are people, and you, people are talking to farmers about what they're producing and why and, and how, and there is that all that connection, and that connection really got traction in Oregon through the wine business. Do you think it would also be fair to say that the efforts that the wine industry went through to be known for what they were doing helped aid or inspire some of the Oregon tourism? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's been a big boost. But that's true in all these other states. I mean, when I was in Wine America, you know, there was no state where the tourism board did not feature its wineries if they had any amount of wineries at all. So Virginia or Pennsylvania or everybody, it's a huge tourist attraction. Michigan. Michigan, an interesting state for a while. Yeah? Some good wines in Michigan. What kind? Pinot Noir. Oh! <laughs> uh, oh. Pinot Noir and Riesling. Um, probably their best wines, but they have some others too. I'll have to look it used to be cherry wine, because it it's the cherry orchards, you know, the Michigan is right. famous for cherries, and now they don't make money in cherries, so many of them converted, or the exposure is right and the climate is right. They, converted to wine. They make really good wine. They make good Pinot Noir. There are very few places that do. I'll definitely have to look them up. What would you say is your favorite varietal? Oh, I don't know. You, you know, I still have a huge attachment to Riesling, but it, it's hard to maintain it because the people who would be producing the Rieslings that I like don't so much. I mean, mm -hmm. now they like New York Riesling is really good, so I, mm. I liked a lot of the New York Rieslings, um, and I think it's it's a really interesting variety. But uh, Pinot Noir, if you can afford it, you know, or you can get some that's not too expensive, is a really good variety. It's really, a, I'm not a huge fan of Pinot Gris. You don't need to put that in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I think Oregon Chardonnay will eventually get somewhere but I mostly like red wines and um, and Pinot Noir is very versatile mm -hmm. a very friendly red wine well is there anything else you'd like to impart or to make sure that I take away with me well I guess it's just if you can capture the spirit of all these people who are both the pioneers and the current generation, people who are really devoted to what they're doing, who see what they're doing as a craft first and a business second. That's what 
Oregon wine is really all about a real devotion to producing something with your stamp of identity uh, that speaks to who you are and what you're trying to accomplish, but also can be something that, that is regarded in, in a world marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's was very special, and it's something that uh, many would aspire to, but there aren't that many opportunities in the world where you get to do that. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Bill.